You're watching The Conservative Talks, brought to you by the ECR Party, your weekly Q&A show on the deeper themes driving the European news cycle. I'm your host, Jorge gonzalez Galarza. Every week, an expert roster of authors, lawmakers, and newsmakers will join me to unpack the events rocking the European Union's foundations in a short, digestible format from a conservative and Euro-realist angle. Welcome to another episode of our series. Today, we are so blessed and delighted to be talking to Professor Joshua Mitchell, who is joining us uh, from Washington, D.C. Uh, Professor Mitchell is a Washington Fellow at the Claremont Center for the American Way of Life. He's also spent much of his career teaching political philosophy and theology at Georgetown University. Uh, he's also part of uh, the 1776 Unites group, uh, which you will hopefully tell us a little bit more about, but he's he's got really a uh, uh, really a breadth of experience researching, teaching, writing on political philosophy, and uh, most importantly uh, for our purposes today, uh, Professor Mitchell came out late, late last year with a fascinating book that we uh, would really encourage our, our audience uh, in Europe uh, to, to, you know, get a, get a copy and, and, and read it. It's called American Awakening, Identity, Politics, and Other Afflictions of Our Time, and obviously as the title suggests, uh, you reflect mostly, Professor, in this book on what you've been witnessing, what you've been reflecting with you know, identity politics in America specifically, but we thought there's so much that you explain in the book that also applies, I think, to, to a wider Western context. We've been witnessing much of the same uh, phenomena that you, that you describe in, in some European countries. And what I thought was so interesting in your book is you really connect this um, uh, with theology and you examine identity politics as a phenomenon through, through the lens of theology. So I I thought we could maybe start uh, right there and have you walk us through some of your thought processes over the years, uh, how this, the idea for the book sprang and, and how you came to develop it and uh, some, of the, some of the good uh, pushback that you've gotten, I guess, from, from, the, uh, from the establishment. Sure. Well, um, normal politics is over. And, and I mean that both in America and in Europe. And normal politics I take to be a kind of give and take between citizens who can have reasonable grounds for disagreement with a view to building a, a common world. And normal politics has been suspended for some time and identity politics has suspended it. And what identity politics seems to be all about is uh, it's an attempt to establish a kind of moral economy based on purity and stain. And the sole purpose of identity politics really is to identify uh, the, those who are stained, identify those who are innocent victims, and the implication for practitioners of it is that uh, by doing so, we, we know where resources need to go, what the state needs to do, et cetera. Um, I tell my conservative friends that it's really quite a mistake to talk about cultural Marxism anymore or multiculturalism. We are long past that phase of, uh, of, of opposition among, in the conservative movement. Um, the confirmation of this really is that um, if you look at the words that are used by people who practice identity politics, they, they are not words used during the time when Americans on the conservative side were pushing back against Marxism. So for example, you have words like fascist, Nazi, hater, denier, homophobe, transphobe, Islamophobe, misogynist, and more recently, insurrectionists. Uh, this is for, since the January 6th event. And these words are not designed to, uh, to, to allow us to enter into a conversation. They are intended to scapegoat and to purge. And the term toxic masculinity is emblematic of this larger problem because a toxin is something that you're supposed to purge from the body. And where the theology comes in is, is in the following respect. You know, if you've read your Christianity and you know your Christianity, you know that the formulation there is that it's a, it's a staggering formulation in its implications. The formulation is uh, there is one sufficient scapegoat, one sufficient divine scapegoat who takes away the sins of the world. This is staggering because in the pagan world, uh, if there's impurity, one identified it oftentimes with another group and so waged total war against them. And what Christianity comes along and says is the problem of the stain of man is so deep that it can't be solved or absolved or, 
uh, or got rid of by scapegoating another group. That is why you get the emergence of a just war theory early on in Christianity, because before war was about purging a toxin. But with just war theory, what you, what you acknowledge is that this is the great temptation, and we have to have other grounds for going for war, to war. It's an extraordinary uh, insight that, that I think is really the foundation of Western civilization. And what's happened is that uh, that insight uh, has, has been increasingly lost. We do not move from a religious world to a secular world. We move from a religious world to a pagan world. And so what's happening with the slow uh, erasure of Christianity is that we're, we're retaining the idea of the scapegoat, but we're no longer seeing a divine resolution to the problem. And very briefly, this is why I think in Eastern Europe, uh, identity politics doesn't quite have the purchase that it does in Western Europe, because if there's guilt and stain, citizens there know that that's a problem that's ultimately resolved in the church. Whereas in Western Europe, there's still a way of absolving it. And so, so the deal that the left offers to Western Europeans is the following. You have profound guilt about your nations, about colonialism, about the Holocaust, we can help you absolve yourself of it. And all you have to do is renounce your nations. And that's the wager that's being offered in Western Europe. The, the equivalent wager in America is uh, it's, we don't have the, the guilt of colonialism and, and two world wars, but we do have the guilt of race, uh, of slavery. And so the, the deal that's being offered by the left is uh, come unto me, re renounce all your, your whiteness, all the institutions of America, the constitution, everything that the founding fathers had to say. And if you renounce that, we will pronounce you free of stain. And so but the identity politics, both in Europe and in, in, in North America, is a way to utterly destroy all the ex existing institutions. And one last thing, my view is that there's, there's no way that this could be pushed back except through the revitalization of Christianity. Because I want to retain the categories of purity and stain, but I think they're most productive and most true when we see them in their proper theological context. This is so fascinating and, and, and such a such a comprehensive um, uh, pitch uh, for your book and, and hopefully people will, will you know, you know uh, get a copy and get stuck in it and, 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 uh, and unpack all of what you've just said. Uh, but I really appreciate you bringing this uh, you know applying this to the to the European context. I think I think uh, some of what you've alluded to just there in terms of some of the countries where you've seen this um, this um, affliction, as you as you call it in the book, of identity politics, and some of uh, some other countries where you haven't, I think that was really interesting, and and um, and, and and people in Europe will really be able to relate to that. Um, now, uh, I want to I want to delve a little deeper here, Professor, in, in your the whole first section of your book, which is this notion of a new moral economy, right, a new way of delineating transgression, right, and, and you know, sin and, and uh, innocence. Um, because it does seem, you know, for, as you prefaced uh, your remarks, you said, you know, the, this is really gonna strike to the core of people who know Christianity, right? It, it really, it inverts Christian theology, but um, even for pe folks who are not steeped in, in, in uh, theology, you know, this, this new, uh, this, this identity politics is, is massively, you know, upsetting politics in a number of ways, right? When you just, as you said, we're no longer normal politics. We're in a state of politics where certain categories of, of people have higher standing in, in right in, in the public square. So can you maybe walk us through some of the ways where you see that happening? Obviously, you've just drawn a, a, a tremendously useful comparison by um, stating the fact that um, in Europe, we've got less of the sort of the um, the identity politics that you've uh, that you've witnessed in, in America. We've got different forms of, uh, of national guilt, colonial guilt, but it is comparable in many respects. What, what, are, what are maybe common ways that you see American Europe um, evolving politically where we have groups that all of a sudden, you know, uh, by mere dint of being a part of that group, all of a sudden, you know, you know that changes the, the politics. So, um, so maybe walk, walk us through some of that. Well, um, so what is happening now is what I call spiritual eugenics. Uh, and, and I mean by this that there is a, a futile hope that somehow we can figure out an easy, cheap way of establishing 
how we should understand one another as human beings. And the way in which identity politics proposes to do that is through your identity. Now, your identity is not your person. So, for example, on my mother's side of the family, I have Welsh, uh, Dutch, and German ancestry. On my father's side of the family, I have Lebanese Antioch Christian uh, ancestry. And yet, and yet I am officially white. Um, I note that if Obama had, uh, or if Hillary Clinton had won, there's a new category that people are talking about. I think it's MENA, Middle Eastern, North African descent. And I would then be a, me a, a member of a privileged minority. And I keep telling my friends that if that were to be the case, I would then sue my various employers uh, for providing a hostile workplace environment because they don't accept my conservative views. So this, this never ends. And the grand hope of identity politics is that we can reduce the, the, the amazing plurality uh, and, and mystery of who people are to a scale. And at the top of the scale is the white heterosexual male. And I, I want to make very clear right now, I have no interest in defending any kind of racial uh, claim here. But it turns out that the white heterosexual male is at the top of the scale. And you can, you can never get you can never erase your debt points if you're a white heterosexual male. And then we can argue about where the scale goes, but to be a woman gives you some, what I call innocence points. Uh, to be black will give you some more. Uh, if you're gay, some more, and on and on and on. You can establish this fairly easily. You can go to what's called your intersectionality scorecard, and you can look that up on the web and figure out how many innocence and guilt points you have. Um, and so the whole of politics is now being configured around this invisible spiritual eugenics, this invisible spiritual economy. Now, you, you did mention what I said at the beginning of the book, and, and, uh, and it leads really to a criticism of many in, uh, in the libertarian wing of the conservative movement, because there really are two economies. There is the economy, the world of payment, as I call it, and then there's this other more mysterious economy. And I say in the preface that uh, in, in the New Testament, Immediately, uh, you have evidence of these uh, two, two economies. So Mary and Joseph and Jesus don't go to the inn. They go to a place uh, where, where they can't be counted. Remember, there's a census that was going to happen. And the whole world was to be counted. And this idea that the world can be reduced to a mechanical scheme or a mathematical scheme um, is, is, uh, is challenged by the very birth of Jesus outside of this. And then, of course, there's Judas, who is the, the, the money caretaker for the disciples. And he wants Jesus to work in the world of payment and to use the silver to, to help the poor. And Jesus says the poor will always be with us. This is not a, a statement of, of cruelty. This is an acknowledgement that there are two economies. And what I've said in the book is that conservatives, in a way, have been blindsided because the push toward the free market idea suggests that the world can be understood wholly in terms of the world of payment, market efficiency. This is a mistake. And I give credit to the left uh, for at least understanding that there is this other invisible economy. My criticism of identity politics is while it's correct in understanding that there is this other invisible economy, its manner of resolving the problem is profoundly unchristian because it seeks to scapegoat a group, whereas the Christian formulation is that there is one sufficient divine scapegoat who takes away the sins of the world. And the, the deepest pathology really, really of identity politics is it allows human beings to, to presume that they are innocent, there's nothing they have to do, there's nothing they have to work out. Now, I'll be the first to say that in the, in the American case of slavery, there is a great deal to work out with the wound of slavery, the legacy of slavery is alive and well. This is why I'm working with Bob Woodson and I think he has a very, very constructive idea of how we deal with this issue. We can talk about this in due course. But I, I think it's important to recognize that the right has very little way of understanding this, especially the libertarian right. It simply wants to understand the world in terms of what I call the world of payment, of market efficiency, et cetera. They're completely blindsided by this. And just to confirm one more aspect of this. So when AOC and other members of the left in America say, we have to have a new, new Green Deal, even if it costs $50 trillion, which of course in the world of payment is simply impossible. In a, in a funny way, they're right. I mean, please don't misunderstand me. They at least recognize that there is this other economy where we have to work through 
stain and purity. And the way they want to do this is they want to have clean green energy and get rid of the dirty fossil fuels. They're, these people are really, the, the left and the right are really talking past one another. And my suggestion for conservatives is that they understand that what identity politics is about is this other economy. Uh, and Christianity, I think, has a much better way of dealing with this other economy. Identity politics is a deep deformation of Christianity, which is why I've called the book American Awakening. There have been two other great American awakenings, one in 1760, one in 1820. And each of these, uh, in each of these, you had uh, citizens running around, people running around, desperately trying to figure out how, whether they were stained, how to achieve purity. And my argument is we have the exact same thing, both in America and in Europe right now, but it is, a, it is a religious awakening without God and without forgiveness, which is what makes it so pathological. This is, this is so fascinating. I think, I think uh, you've just given so much food for thought and, and most importantly, a lot of uh, really an omen of, of what we can expect from this movement. Uh, your, your point of, uh, you know, um, inverting uh, this economy, this moral economy back to where uh, it, it used to be in the West or back to, to what we've known it to be through the influence of Christianity. I, I find that point really interesting. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and also I think what's, what's very, um, what's very ominous is, is, is what you describe as, as, you know, we in the right are perhaps uh, not well equipped uh, to tackle this, this new, um, this, this new, um, uh, this new politics. And, and we've just reduced ourselves to a, to a, um, you know, uh, a vision of, of the economy, as you called it, which has many different definitions, but which is very narrow and, and doesn't allow us to address uh, this phenomenon uh, completely. Um, I, I think we've we've addressed really a lot of what I wanted to get to in, into uh, from your book, but uh, there's another really interesting part, Professor, where you um, describe, and I, I wondered if if we you can maybe get into some of this. Is you explain that what identity politics threatens is uh, among many things what you call the liberal politics of competence. I, I wonder if you can unpack some of that for us, but uh, also with a view to uh, another, another uh, couple of really interesting concepts that you, that you develop, bipolarity and addiction. And it seems like, you know, they're, they're, that makes for a sort of multi-fronted, uh, you know, uh, assault on, on liberal politics as, as we used to know them. So can you maybe um, relate that to the, to the wider set of threats you see and, and what, what, you tr what are you trying to tell us with bipolarity and addiction? Well, let me take the first part of your question. So liberal politics of competence is, in my view, a, a, a politics in which we actually try to solve problems. We actually, we recognize our differences. I have no interest in saying there aren't these differences. I, I think we should, you know, I don't like the word celebrate them, but I think we recognize that we live in a plural world and it's a wonderfully, wonderfully plural world that always surprises us. But we have to figure out a way to build the world together. And what that means is we have to, uh, we, have, we can start with the recognition that I might be part Lebanese and part Welsh, but that's not going to help really in you and I building a world together. Um, it's an entree, but the problem with identity politics is, is that it, it, it makes it the final statement. So if you don't accept this about me, then I'm not going to work with you at all. And just to be Tocquevillian just for a minute, I mean, Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote the great book, Democracy in America in a way foresaw all of this because he said, as human beings become more and more delinked and lonely and isolated, they're not gonna need one another. So identity politics really can't even emerge until the world is, is so constituted that people can have the illusion that they don't need to work with one another. That if you don't like a person, you don't have to work with them. You know, I grew up uh, still at the tail end of a kind of tougher period, the early part of the sixties anyway, before everything fell apart, but stories from my father and, and his generation, uh, second generation immigrants who, you know, were not particularly accepted. And that is the lot, by the way, of every immigrant group, immigrant group. And it will always be. It takes several generations and you just have to tough it out. But the idea that, you know, my father could have said, well, I'm Lebanese. I'm a, you know, I'm a, uh, I need special treatment. I mean, this is just unheard of. We're going to bump into each other. And I'm not troubled by us bumping into each other. I'm very troubled by our increasing inability to deal with the fact that we really misunderstand each other. And the only way to get past that is to actually build a world together and to realize that you might claim you're black or you might claim you're white, but, but what you really are is gonna be established through the working out with other people, not simply by you sitting back in your own head and making declarations. So that's, that's liberal politics. But when I, when I completed that section of the book, which is really the first half, I realized that even if identity politics 
disappeared tomorrow, we would have two really, really big problems. And the second one uh, is what I call bipolarity. Uh, and that is deeply embedded to Tocqueville, that whole section. And I've, I've been a Tocqueville scholar for 30 years or so. And I, I do see that in my view, he's the last one remaining from the 19th century who can help us really understand the world. Toward the end of democracy in America, he writes, I foresee a time when in the late democratic age, citizens will see themselves to be greater than kings and less than men, not or and less than men. And the way I, I update this is I say, we're living now in a world of what I call management society and selfie man. So uh, let's take the selfie man first. We have to give some philosophical account of why tens of millions of people every day are taking selfies. And of course, what this means is that somehow the world is a backdrop for, for you, the most important person in the world. We become sovereign selves as we become selfie man. And so we pay, post on our Facebook pages. I, by the way, have no social media and give a lecture called Facebook is death. Uh, but but we, we post on our Facebook pages and we are sovereign on those pages. Uh, and, and yet, on the other hand, uh, precisely because we're delinked and alone and can be a sovereign self, we're also uh, disconnected from everybody, anonymous, and feel ourselves to be completely impotent. And so you have this strange oscillation back and forth, between, which is bipolarity, uh, between feeling yourself greater than kings one day and, and less than men on the other. This was shown really when Trump uh, left the Paris Accord and the world had a collective freakout because the implication was the only possible way that we can solve this problem is if there's, if there's global managers who are working in concert with one another. And my view is if we have problems, we should decentralize because it might be that the, the Indians come up with one solution, the Chinese another, the Americans another, and the French another. I mean, this is the way that you solve problems. You don't, you don't authorize and affect crony capitalism uh, which makes permanent winners out of corporations and, and wealthy uh, members of the government who were involved in the revolving door back and forth between corporations uh, and the government. So, so Tocqueville's solution to this problem was that we have to build a world in these face-to-face -face relations because when we, re we re relink through voluntary associations, then we can't be sovereign selves because our neighbor reminds us of our own limitations and, and also uh, then we're drawn out of ourselves and uh, we're able to build a world with other people. This of course ties directly with what I said about uh, liberal competence. My view is that Tocqueville got this right. We have to build a world through face-to-face -face relations and all the mediating institutions. The conservatives really, they understand are important. I'm not quite, quite exactly sure why. So the churches, the family, these are the places where we come together and get pulled out of ourselves and build a world in these face-to-face -face relations. So if you don't have that, Tocqueville said, you're going to have this oscillation back and forth. And so the configuration post-1989, as I've argued in the book and elsewhere, is really management society and selfie man. For the smallest tasks, we declare ourselves unable to work together. We have to hand it over to the global managers. And yet here we declare ourselves to be greater than kings. This is a really strange oscillation. And the way I... Uh, the way I deal with this with my students, especially at Georgetown and, and other places, is I say, how is this working for you? I mean, one moment you sense yourself to be greater than kings, and then you fall into utter despair. And it's not by accident that this configuration can only be held together through drug use, uh, through all sorts of the medicalization of the human condition as a way of, of putting to sleep the real problem, which is a problem of social of associations. And the first thing I wrote after COVID came out was I said, look, you can die many ways. Uh, you can die uh, through exposure to be sure, and maybe we have to have some responsible social distancing measures, but we will die very quickly politically if we come not to look at our neighbor as we pass them in the street, if we look only up to the state, if we order only on Amazon, et cetera. So that's, we're, we're producing a kind of political death even as we save lives. And I'm not advocating recklessness here, and I'm simply saying that if Tocqueville had designed a system that would bring us to the gentle tyranny at the end of history, it would be exactly what we're doing. And if you'd like, I can say one more thing about addiction. So when I finished that section, I thought, well, that's not even enough. And so, uh, so I, I looked at a whole number of phenomena 
including things like uh, obesity rates, opioid addiction, Facebook, Amazon, driverless cars, artificial intelligence, even fiat, even fiat currency. And I said, you know, all of these things, we know there's something going on with them, but we're not quite sure what unites them. Mm-hmm. And from Plato, in, in book three and book four of the Republic, you find this first distinction between supplements and substitutes. And, uh, and Plato said that we must be very careful not to turn supplements into substitutes. And so now let's fast forward to the present day. Facebook gives us Facebook friends. Uh, Amazon gives us online shopping. So there's shopping and friendship. Now, friendship is something that's very difficult to establish and to maintain. There's a connoisseurship to it. There is no recipe. One has to work very, very hard at it. And I think also with shopping, I mean, real shopping is it's connoisseurship. It's an art. You don't send somebody who doesn't know how to buy groceries to the grocery store because they're going to get all the wrong things. And so what's happened in, in, in all of these things I've mentioned is that we've turned supplements into substitutes. So people have thousands of Facebook friends, and that's fine if you know what friendship is. But the problem is if you turn the supplement of Facebook friends into a substitute for friendship, we eventually, like the opioid addict, uh, we, we get this high of having these so-called friendships, but we also feel this tremendous emptiness. And so I'm saying the disease is what I call substitutism, even driverless cars, the dream of driverless cars. Driving is a competence. And I'm all for uh, having driverless cars if we maintain the competence of driving. But if we turn that supplement of driving cars, driverless cars into a substitute for it, then what are we going to what's going to happen when the powerful state decides they're going to turn off the driverless car that comes to your house. You're, you're stuck in your, you can't get, navigate, even Google Maps. I have a section on Google Maps. So what's happening is we're looking for cheap shortcuts. The work of life is really, really hard. It can only be learned in embedded communities. This is why we have to have our nations, why we have to have our families, our civic associations, this rich network in which we come to understand what it means to be human in a very palpable way. But the grand global experiment we're we're, uh, performing, in addition to identity politics and bipolarity, is this substitutism. And it's absolutely everywhere. And the the really sad thing is it comes to an end in the way that drug addiction comes to an end. That is to say, you will keep extending until you crash and hit the ground. And whether it's with fiat currency, opioid addiction, Facebook friends, I believe, I'm not going to say we're on the cusp of it, because I think this can go on for a very, very long time. But I think we're witnessing these patho- this pathology in multiple forms, and we would do well to see the common link. Well, this is, uh, we're so, I'm so grateful, Professor, because you, you are giving us really, uh, a, um, you know, a, a piece of your mind uh, that goes far beyond a lot of what's already in the book. And, and you know, you're, you're very much in the business of, you um, of you know, uh, of trying to analyzing and, and bringing uh, political philosophy, uh, you know, to bear in the analysis of, of what we witness um, as a society. And, and I, I thought your reference was to, to Tocqueville was was so interesting because as, as a Frenchman, one of the things he was really struck by was the associational richness that you've just mentioned. And if looking at America from Europe, it's very striking that that's one of the things that is evanescing is that the ability to work on real world problems as citizens coming together without needing. And, and, and he was, as you mentioned in the book, the, the, um, the, the how ominous Tocqueville was in, in, in his, um, in, in his, in the, that, that uh, dichotomy of, of selfie man. And, and well, that's your term, but he, he spoke yeah. right greater than Kings um, uh, and, and lower than man. So um, there's something else that we're also uh, witnessing, and this is just going to be a parting, a parting uh, ant question that I want to ask you if, if you can share uh, maybe a couple of thoughts on this is uh, something else that uh, we uh, commonly have understood Americans to cherish, apart from the associations, is kind of the, the constitutional patrimony, the, the idea that there is a glue that binds America together and the founding documents and, and all the the great heritage of, of, um, of the Republic. And, and, and uh, the reason I want to ask you this question, a lot of your, your colleagues from, from the Claremont Institute were uh, in a commission that you know, lived, you know, had a very brief life, was recently disbanded by the new administration. So for maybe your, my, my parting question for, for your uh, couple of brief thoughts from you is what, what can you tell us about, are, are, um, are your worst predictions of what a, what a democratic administration would look like coming 
or, or the uh, or, or the um, being confirmed. Uh, what what have you um, what have you been witnessing in, in some of these sort of the um, uh, the, the pandering to uh, woke culture that we see the, the new administration do. What, what's your what's your assessment of that? So uh, you made two questions. So the first on the 1776 commission, there is a titanic battle in America right now going on about you know, what is the origin of America. So the 1619 project, as some of you may know, uh, was a, an attempt to say that the beginning of America was slavery, uh, and we have systemic racism, and it will never go away. Uh, and, and, and we have to understand what the political implications of this are. It means your families can't help. It means you can't do anything. It means your religion can't help you. It means your community can't do anything. It means that we need to spend more money uh, through state programs. So this is, this is an escalation, a kind of metastasis of the welfare state uh, with a view to solving problems, but it's never really interested in solving problems at all. The 1776 Commission emerged really in reaction to that. And so so did Bob Woodson's 1776 Unites, of which I'm a member. Uh, we were pretty horrified by this depiction uh, of, of the American situation. But Bob in particular, Bob's black in about 83 and has been, was a civil rights worker, got tired of the racial grievance industry. He and I wrote an essay in the Wall Street Journal that was published on, on the Martin Luther King Day entitled How the Left Betrayed Martin Luther King. And the argument was that uh, the history of black American thought is the belief in agency, they had huge disagreements, but they believed that they had some challenge or some, some capacity to shape their destiny. What you get beginning in the 1960s is, uh, is the abandonment of this idea and the, the sense that the state is, you know, state is so racist, America is so racist that only more programs. So you have a, a complete capitulation to the idea of fate. And Martin Luther King did not believe that. Uh, but when you make claims like systemic racism, then you're going to make claims that the state, America's stained and the state has to help. 1776 Commission was designed to counter that. And that's the ongoing battle. Was the founding, you know, re, was it sufficient ground? I will not say it's pure. I'm not going to say that because there's no founding that's pure. But was it, does it have a sufficient ground to address the problems in America? In my view, and so many of my colleagues right of center is, look, we, we went through a civil war. We had a refounding. The amendment process, the, the, the division of government in the three parts, we have the resources within the existing constitutional framework to solve any problem that we are faced with. So people will say racism, and I will say, okay, well, if there's somebody who's not being treated right in accordance with the rule of law, then you prosecute them. But that's not what's being said today. What's being said today is racism, therefore, we have to take down the whole thing. With respect to the Biden administration, I had some, for the first few days, I had a hope that in fact, there would be a movement toward the center. Biden, he knows politics. He, you know, he survived for 48 years and that's not easy to do in American politics. So he knows how to find the middle. The problem is that the, the Democratic Party is itself at war with itself. There, are, there do remain uh, some moderates who, who have increasingly adopted the language of identity politics. But frankly, and I'll give you the list. It's, it's Biden, it's Pelosi, it's Schumer, it's even Hillary Clinton. Uh, but what's happened is you've got a whole new wing of the Democratic Party that wants to go full on identity politics, wants to rip the American regime apart. And, uh, and I think what's happening in the Democratic Party is Biden, Biden's people are trying to find a middle, but they can't because, to use the English phrase, the train has left the station. Identity politics has really taken over at the grassroots level of the Democratic Party. And so everything that I write about in the book is going to happen in the next four years. I did think Trump was going to get reelected, but it, 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 in a way, it's not about Trump. It's about whether identity politics can be stopped. And I think what's going to happen at some point is that it, it will kind of collapse of its own weight. Very briefly, I think that there's one group in America that has the moral authority to call an end to it right now, and that's Black Americans, because identity politics makes the following argument. Um, as the civil rights goes, so goes women's rights, gay rights, and transgender rights. And so the, the moral authority for these subsequent movements rests on what I call the black template of innocence. And, you know, the irony is, you know, we can be sensitive about people who are wrestling with what it means to be a man and a woman. I'm not saying we should be insensitive. But the irony here is that the way in which the transgender position is being defended now 
is that anyone who believes that a man is a man and a woman is a woman is, is attacked, dismissed, and canceled. Now, Martin Luther King thought the state had to supplement the civic institutions, the family and the churches, but not substitute for it. And so you've got substitutism even in, in the form of the welfare movement. But, but Black Americans are generally a conservative group. They, they have deep memories. They know that what slavery did was it ripped the family apart. And immediately after the Civil War, they have very high rates of family formation. The welfare state, of course, destroyed that. Uh, you've got you know, 60, 70% rates of out of birth wedlock or out of wedlock births now in, the, in Black America. So, uh, so it's just not going to wash to say that the family is heteronormative and the church is homophobic. There, there are real differences in a society, but you cannot use the exception to destroy the rule. That's not toleration, that's excision. That's, that's surgically eliminating the vast majority of the people. Michael Oakeshott had a beautiful phrase in the 1950s. He said, society has to bet on the pack. There'll be people who do this and people who do that that aren't in the, in the moderate middle, but your society has to support the family in the conventional sense, the generative family. Your society has to generally support the churches uh, and if it doesn't, the people who are going to get harmed are not the elite white liberals who, who live that life but speak otherwise. It's the people who are on the margins, who need every encouragement to form families, every encouragement to learn the moral lessons of the churches. So Bob Woodson and I and, and a number of people formed 1776 in a way to push back against this idea that, that Black America is fated to be subject to the state, which is really the lesson of the argument about systemic racism. This is this is uh, this is so wonderful. I'm so happy we got uh, you know an extended uh, discussion about your book, and uh, I believe it should be out in, in Europe as well. But it's uh, it's certainly um, one of the things that I really enjoyed reading it, reflecting on America, which is a subject of what you discuss, but uh, also on the broader on the phenomenon itself, which uh, you know has has been uh, seen uh, erupting in, in 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 our side of the Atlantic as well. And what what I like what I liked about it is there's so much. Um, theoretical meat about it that you can also transpose it to Europe and start understanding kind of the, the dynamic that we're seeing at work. Some of our problems may be different. We may have, again, like you explained at the beginning, more of the post-colonial guild than the, um, yeah. than the multi, um, you know, than the, the sort of the, the, some of the issues you've just alluded to um, uh, in terms of rewrite, the rewriting of history and whatnot. But, um, but we can use your insights to understand what is going on in, in across Western society. So we're so, we're so happy and glad you were able to talk to us today, uh, Professor Mitchell, and uh, congratulations on the book. And we, we look forward to, to seeing you on, on another occasion. Thank you. It's been wonderful talking with you. Thank you. That is all the time we have for this episode. If you like what you've watched, stay tuned for future episodes on YouTube and across the ECR Party social media presence. Thank you.